I want to take your Bible this evening, if you would please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for our scripture reading, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We are going to read verses 8 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 8 through 13. And we'll read the verses responsively. I'll be, we'll begin together on verse 8, and I'll read 9, and we'll alternate reading like that till we end on verse number 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And as we usually do, let's stand together to read the Scripture, all of us standing to read God's Word together. And let's begin on verse 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Ready? Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Let's end with 13 reading together also. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible tonight, and we're asking you, Lord, that it would be to us what you would want it to be. Lord, there's folks tonight who need comforted. There's folks tonight who need encouraged. There's other folks who need challenged. Lord, whatever it is that is needed, I pray you'd use your word to minister to that need tonight. Thank you for the good music we've already heard this evening, and I pray you'll bless the ladies as they sing the special. I pray, Lord, you'll continue to minister to our heart through their song and prepare us to receive your word tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Could it be that up in heaven God is sitting on his throne Anticipating another sinner Will soon become his own Years of wasted living And years of toil and strife Are just about to be over As he receives the gift of life Go son Spirit has been working to soften up a heart. All he needs is a willing servant to simply do his part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy there is that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can't you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir, a sinner is doesn't know yet what is waiting when the Savior he'll meet, he'll meet. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son, all heaven rejoices. 
that's the value of one. All heaven rejoices. That's the value of one. Amen. Now, our Father in heaven, we bow before you tonight as we come to open up your word. And Lord, again, we want to thank you for the Bible. And Lord, I'm asking you tonight that, again, you would use the word of God in each one of our hearts and lives. That, Lord, each of us would listen carefully tonight. We would simply ask you now to help us to focus. There's many things that could capture our attention and take our thoughts away from giving our full attention to what you want to say to us this evening. So, Lord, I pray that you would help me to keep my attention on you and help each of the listeners to keep their attention on you as well and that you would accomplish what you would like to in these next few moments as we look into your word together. Holy Spirit of God, open our understanding that we can rightly divide the word of truth, that we can grasp the truth that's before us tonight. So help me to be clear and give the people understanding as only you can. May your will be done. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. The Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. I've been uh, attending church all of my life. Uh, I'm pretty sure I probably somewhere in a little church in Hartville, Ohio, if they still have the crib, would have teeth marks on the crib from cutting my teeth in the church nursery. Uh, ever since I can remember, we went to church. I, I thank God I had a father who said we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Uh, sunrise east sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill. That's what we did. And uh, I thank God for that. And so through those years, I don't know how many thousands of sermons that I've heard uh, in uh, 60 years of being in church. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I don't even know how many messages that I've preached in 36 years of being in the ministry. Uh, but I've heard a lot of sermons on faith. Uh, you probably have too. You can think about sermons on faith and uh, how to have faith and what brings faith and how to live by faith and where to walk by faith and not by sight. And then charity. And, and by the way, uh, I think we do a disservice uh, when we just call it love. It's love, but it's more than love. Uh, you know, the Bible, the Bible has love not the world, neither the things of the world. The Bible has, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love is mentioned many times throughout the Bible, but here in 1 Corinthians 13, he doesn't use the word love, he uses the word charity. And we know love is the willing, sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. Your, your, your love is meeting the needs of someone else without expecting anything back, okay? That's, that's love. That's the kind of love God has for us. And yet charity, charity is that, but charity is more than that. Um, you can... You can love someone without necessarily wanting or desiring the best for them. There's no, you don't have to have feeling behind it. That's why you can love your enemies. What he said, if he hungers, what are you supposed to do? Feed him. Did he say you had to like him? Did he say you had to feel good about it? No, he didn't. He said you feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's naked, clothe him. He said that's what you're supposed to do. Why? That's showing love to them. But charity means... I, I, I not only want to do good for you, I desire the best for you. I have feelings for you, and I want the best for you. It goes deeper than just an act of service. It, it gets into my feelings for you. That's why it describes all through 1 Corinthians 13 about how, how it rejoices not in iniquity, and it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. It always wants the best. That's charity. And, and I've heard sermons on charity. I've heard a lot of sermons on love. But the one that sometimes gets ignored is hope. The, I think the ignored one is the word hope. Now, I'm not talking about the hope of his return. 
are the hope of heaven. Though I'll refer to that a little bit this evening. And I think the reason that we have a hard time grasping or hearing many messages on hope is because hope as it's used in the Bible is different than the way we use the word hope today. And you have to understand that. In our day and age, we use the word hope has, you know, cross my fingers and hope to die. Or I hope Ohio State wins this week. I, I, I hope I pass the test in school tomorrow. We'll say that I, you know, uh, young girls say, I hope I meet some guy and can get married someday. In fact, they used to have, uh, I don't know if anybody does this anymore, used to have a, a, a box and you would put things in it. And they called that a hope chest. Hopefully I'll get married one day. And I'll have these things set aside for marriage. But, but that's not the way hope is used in the Bible. In other words, hope in the world means it may happen someday. But hope, as, it used, as it's used in the Bible, means it will happen. Not it might happen, or not it may happen. Not, not cross my fingers and carry a horseshoe in my pocket and you know pick off a four-leaf clover. It's, it's, it absolutely will happen. It is a certainty. In other words, it won't uh, possibly come to pass. It means it will come to pass. That's why the Bible says that we sorrow not as those who have no hope. No hope. No certainty. No, no uh, confidence of heaven. When, when we have a loved one, and we'll look at that passage in a little bit in 1 Thessalonians 4, and they were concerned about loved ones who had passed away and gone on to heaven. And, and Paul said, I, I know you're going to sorrow, but you don't sorrow as those who don't have any hope. They have no confidence. They have no assurance they're ever going to see their loved one again. And Paul's saying, I'm not wishing to see him. I'm not telling you to be hopeful you'll see him one day. I'm telling you, you will see them again one day. And so that's a confidence that we have. We know that faith, while, while charity or love is when you sacrificially give yourself for the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. We know faith, faith is, if you want to shorten it up, faith would just be taking God at His word. In other words, God said it, I believe it. Period. And uh, I'm going to act on what God said. It's a, in, in our you, they say it's a personal measurement of the level of my confidence in what God has done and what God will do in, through, and for me. That's a long one, okay? And, and you might be able to grasp all of that. But it's basically, it's a level of your confidence in God. That's your faith. Now, we know that faith always has doubt as part of it. We can have faith, but there's always a little bit of doubt there. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That's why the Hebrew children said, uh, Our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if not, we're still not bowing down. What is it? They had a little bit of doubt. We and I are the same way. We can, we can pray in faith or we believe God for something and, and, and we're praying about it. And when God answers the prayer, when God comes through, our faith is rewarded, what do we do? Guess what? You don't believe what happened. God did this. Huh? And we're all excited. Why are we all excited? Because we had enough doubt that we were excited when God did come through. We are excited when He did answer the prayer. Because faith always has the little bit of doubt. There's always a risk involved with faith. But let's talk about hope. When, when, listen, when faith leads to assurance, it becomes hope. When faith leads to assurance, it becomes hope. When doubt is removed from faith, you have hope. That's why Titus 2 and verse 14. Would you turn there with me? I'm going to have you turn in your Bible to a few scriptures this evening, all right? So look at Titus chapter 2, a familiar verse to us. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus chapter 2. A familiar verse to us. The Bible says in verse 13, Looking for that blessed 
hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a blessed hope. Does that mean we're crossing our fingers and hoping and wishing that Jesus may come? No, it doesn't mean that. It means we're confident we are expecting Him to come. He absolutely is coming. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> and so it's not a matter of, there's no doubt in there. I don't believe He's coming by faith. I believe He's coming by hope. I'm confident. There's no doubt about it. Okay? And, and so we're to be looking for Him. So faith says, I know God will do this. I think. Hope says, I know God will do this. Period. Period. And what I think we need, and what I need, and what I think you need is hope. I think when our son or our daughter goes astray, what you need is hope. When the doctor says cancer, what you need is hope. When a loved one passes, what you need is hope. When the finances are tight and the bills are due, what you need is hope. When the marriage is in trouble and the relationship is struggling, what you need is hope. When the pink slip comes on the job, what you need is hope. It's not just enough to have faith for the future. You need hope for the future. Hope. Faith is me believing God will do His part. Hope is knowing God will do His part. Faith is a joint venture between God and me. But hope is all God. Faith is a duet. Hope is a solo. Just God. Faith, faith is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But hope is Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's hope. Faith is believing what God can do with me, in me, and through me. But hope is knowing what God can do without me and for me. That's hope. Faith is the father of the prodigal son getting the ring ready and fattening the calf. Hope is him sitting on the front porch waiting for his son to come home. Faith says raise the calf. Faith says buy the ring. Faith says get the shoes ready for his feet. But faith doesn't bring him back. Hope says he is coming home. He is returning. Now, I'll never, I'll never have hope if I run short on faith. I have to have faith in order to get to hope. The songwriter wrote this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. So my hope, he's not saying my, my, my wish. I'm crossing my fingers. No, he's saying my confidence, my expectation, my surety is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's why the Bible says, uh, the songwriter said, My hope is in the Lord who gave Himself for me and paid the price for all my sin on Calvary. I don't, I don't think I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Amen. You know why? I'm saved by hope. Okay? My hope is built on Jesus' blood and righteousness. I don't have faith in the rapture. I have hope in the rapture. I don't sorrow as those who have no hope. When we say goodbye to our loved ones, we have a loved one pass like, like your father and like mine did ten years ago next month. We say goodbye to our loved ones and goodbye to those who are dear to us. I don't have faith that I'll see them again. I have hope that I'll see them again. I have a confident expectation. I don't think I will. I know I will. I have hope 
That's the blessed hope that the believer has. There's no doubt about it. Notice back in Titus 2 and verse 13, it, 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 notice how he, he phrased this verse, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not just His appearing I'm looking for. I'm looking for that blessed hope. I want to get to where His appearing, His coming for me, is, is a blessed hope to me. It's a blessed assurance. It's a blessed expectation of mine. Not a wish. Not just something I'm crossing my fingers for. Not, not hope the way the world defines hope, but hope the way the Word defines hope. It's a confidence that we have. I'm looking for the day when His appearing will become a blessed hope to you and me. An assurance, an expectation. Now, let me give you just, just a, a few thoughts this evening. Number one, how do we get hope? How do we get to hope? You get hope by keeping on by faith. You get to hope by keeping on by faith. What do you mean? What do you mean? Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Keep on working. Faith is always active. Faith is not passive. That's why James says, I'll show you my faith. How? By my works. In fact, faith without works is dead. Faith is always active. It's not passive. And so faith is a work and, 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 and faith is active. Hope is peace. Hope is faith perfected. Look at Romans chapter 5 with me tonight. Will you please turn over to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, beginning in verse number 1, some of you are familiar with this passage, it says, Therefore, being justified by... Justified by what, church? Faith. faith. So we're starting with faith, aren't we? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience... Hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So it begins with faith, and it ends with hope. And hope doesn't make ashamed, because hope is a sure thing. Hope is an expectation. And, and so we know that clouds come, storms of life beat upon us, Everybody goes through deep water in life at some point or another. And we need an anchor for our soul. And I'm going to come to that a little bit in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Our soul is not anchored on faith, it's anchored on hope. Hope. Not just believing God, but knowing that God... Not just believing God will provide, but knowing God will provide. Not just believing what God can do, but knowing what God can do. Hope. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 23. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 23. <clears throat> this is a great, great verse here. I'm sorry, let's... Yeah, I'll start with verse 23 and we'll go on down to verse 27. The Bible says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. How do you get hope? You continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and you be not moved away from the hope of the Gospel. That's the certainty of the Gospel. All right, Which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, have made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is left behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church, whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Have you noticed we haven't come to a period yet? Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages 
and from generations, and now is made manifest to His saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, where? In you, which is what? The hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Notice it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's your certainty of glory? What's your expectation of glory? What's your absolute certainty that you're going to be in glory one day with God? Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. And so we know we can get hope by continuing on in faith. By walking by faith and not by sight. And that faith, God will turn into hope. But secondly, look back at Romans chapter 15 with me. The second, re second way we can get hope in our life is by the Word of God. By the Scriptures. The Scriptures will bring us hope. Notice Romans 15 with me. And look at verse number 4. Romans 15 and verse 4. Are you there? All right. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have what? Hope. We might have hope through patience and comfort of the Scriptures. You know what gives you hope? Wait a minute now. Hope is certainty. Hope is confidence. What gives you that hope? What gives you that certainty? What gives you that confidence? The Scriptures do. The Scriptures give you that confidence. The Scriptures give you that hope. When you have little confidence, you have, you have little certainty, it's probably because you've been very little in your Bible. Many Christians are very hesitant to talk about the Bible or hesitant to get into kind of a spiritual discussion because they're fearful that their Bible, their lack of Bible knowledge will come out. And so their confidence is very low. Sometimes people are afraid to witness. Afraid to talk to someone else about Christ. You know why? I'm afraid they're going to ask me a question that I don't know the answer to. And by the way, that's never a fear. Someone at, You witness someone and they ask you a question you don't know the answer to. You know what you say? <clears throat> I don't know. Huh. I don't know what the answer is, but I'll find out. I'll find out and get back to you. Plus, it gives you a reason to come back and talk to them again. Okay? That's okay. And uh, nobody, nobody all, all you're doing is you're telling them what Jesus Christ has done for you. You're telling them what you know of the Word of God. And certainly they can come up with a question you don't know. But <clears throat> we, we continue, we're continuing in faith. We said that's, that's the one way you get hope is you continue on walking by faith, believing God, trusting God, taking God at His Word, and soon God will, will replace that faith with hope. He'll remove all doubt. And no longer be faith, it'll be hope. But the way you get that is with the Scriptures. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's how you increase your faith. When you say, Lord, increase my faith, we know there's, <clears throat> there's no faith, there's faith, there's little faith, there's much faith. Faith grows. And so faith grows by the Word of God. George Mueller had tremendous faith. Prayed in millions of dollars for his orphans. And, and this was back in the 1800s. And, and, and never told a soul about his needs. He made a covenant with God that he would never tell another human being what he needed. He would only tell God. And time after time after time, God provided for his need. And he became known as a great man of faith. But when he passed away and they got his Bible, they found out he'd read through his Bible over 200 times. And by the way, you think you're busy. I think they said he averaged answering over 3,000 letters a year. That's, uh, that's handwriting, the letters, despite running orphanages with several thousand orphans. <clears throat> you get hope by the Word of God. You get hope by continuing in faith. Number three, the Holy Spirit gives us hope. Look at verse 13 of Romans 15. The Bible says, now, I like this, now the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace 
in believing. <clears throat> that ye may abound in what? Hope. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. How can I abound in hope? How can I overflow with this confidence? How can I overflow with this expectation, with this surety? It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something I can work up. It's not something you can work up. It's something that the Holy Spirit will give you. He'll cause you to abound in hope. He'll cause you to overflow with hope. Let me tell you something. You can go to the mall or you can go to a store and you can find all kinds of products. You can certainly go on Amazon and, and shop for just about anything you want. But I guarantee you, you type in on Amazon, I'd like to buy some hope. And you're going to come up with no results. You can't purchase this anywhere else. You know where people find hope? They find hope in the, in the church of Jesus Christ. Because we have the Word of God. We have the Son of God. We have the salvation of God. And it's, listen, we have the Spirit of God. The hope is, is dispensed by the Word of God. It's given to us by the Son of God. It's empowered in us by the Spirit of God. Hope comes from God. Somebody says, man, we need hope in this world. Well, you've got to get God back in the world again. If you don't have God in this world, there's no hope, my friend. See, hope isn't for sale. It's free to anyone who wants it. It's available to anyone who'd like to have it. It's free for anybody who would keep on exercising faith, believing God, walking by faith and not by sight, staying in the Scriptures, yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, and you can have confident expectation. You cannot think, oh, I hope it'll happen, meaning I wish it'll happen. That's what the world says. You can say, I know it will happen. I know it's going to take place. I have hope. The way the Bible defines hope. When we came to Bible Baptist Church, the last Sunday of November in 2005, of October of 2005, the church voted for us to come be the pastor. And we, we believed by faith that this is where we should come. So what's that mean? It means we were sure this is where God wanted us. We, we, we thought. Say, <laughs> so did you have some doubt? Absolutely. Huh? And uh, some of you were here back then. And uh, the gold carpeting and the gold pews and the colored windows and the white walls and everything that was here. We thought this is what God wanted and we did it by faith. And so what, what happens is you come. I remember we were talking today about some folks who uh, the first few years, you know what happens when you come to a church and you're the new guy in town? Everybody comes check you out. And we had people come, stay a while, and then they, they go out. And some of them come to see if they can run the church, you know. And um, when they find out it, they weren't going to run the church, then they, they want to go somewhere else see where they can go to church. But, but the, uh, you keep on going by faith. You keep on moving by faith. What is it? Trusting God. Believing God. Having confidence in God. Even though there can be doubts. But you see... Along the way, in 12 and a half years, and I'm not exactly sure when it was, but I can tell you tonight I'm not here by faith. I'm here by hope. Now, I'm not, I don't by faith believe God wants me here. I by hope know God wants me here. See, God has turned that faith into hope. And now, now you may not have that hope that I should be here. But I have that hope. Okay? And, and that's what God does. God moves you from faith to hope. And, and don't expect, and by the way, I say that, you know, kind of humorously, but the truth is you have to understand, God's going to move you from faith to hope in some areas that He's not going to move someone else. 
and they're going to look at you like you're crazy. That, that you, they don't understand. But God has given you, you have, you have kept on believing by faith and kept on walking by faith. Abraham's known as the father of faith. But when you read Romans chapter 4, you know what it says about Abraham? Who against hope believed in hope. Well, somewhere along the line, he went from faith to hope. And God brought to pass what he promised Abraham. It's an amazing thing. And so, allow God, if you're tonight believing things by faith and you're getting a little weary, don't get weary in well-doing. Keep believing God. Keep trusting God. God's going to bring you. God's going to replace that faith with hope. And you're going to have a confident expectation. Have you ever? Have you ever had a sick child in the nighttime? And a fever? And you're putting cold claws on their head and you're praying? And you're, you're, you're deciding, do I take them to the hospital? Do I just uh, see this through? What do I do? And you're praying and asking God, have you ever been doing that, Mom? You ever been doing that, Dad? And all of a sudden, God gives you a peace in your heart that everything's going to be all right? Everything will be okay? You know what happened? God just passed you from faith to hope. And now you knew everything's going to be okay, and you could, rest it, you, you, could, you could rest in peace because you knew God had taken care of it. With hope always comes peace. See? And, and you can rest in what God says. Hope comes from God in response to continued faith. You have faith in some area tonight. You're, you're, you're at Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You're still working at believing and working at trusting God. But in other areas, you have Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all of my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The difference is you keep on by faith. You keep on walking by faith. Hope is God's reward for a continued faith. Now look with me at Hebrews chapter 6, would you please? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6. I alluded to this earlier in the message and I want you to look at it now. Are you all right? You okay? I, I hope if it does nothing else, I hope every time you read the Bible now and you come across that word hope, you'll, you'll understand it a little differently than what you did before. Because now you understand the Bible meaning of hope, not the world's meaning of hope. In Hebrews chapter 6, start with verse 16. The Bible says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. How many times you, uh, somebody's having an argument, and someone will say, No, I swear in the Bible this is true. Well, that ends that argument. He's telling the truth. Okay? You know what I mean? He's swearing by an oath. That's what he's talking about. That usually ends the strife. But notice what he says. We're in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong, a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as a what? Anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Listen carefully. In Bible times, before they had the technology to dredge out harbors, ancient mariners came up with an ingenious way to get a ship into a small harbor. The ship would be outside the harbor and there might be a lot of dangerous rocks. And they would take one little boat and one sailor would get in that boat and the big ship would lower their anchor into that boat. 
And then that one sailor who they called a forerunner would row into the harbor, would find a place where there were some good rocks, and he would place that anchor there. The anchor being attached to the ship. He would secure that anchor in the rock. Then all the ship had to do to enter the harbor was take the slack out of the rope. The ship wasn't in the harbor, but the anchor was. And that meant the ship was as good as in the harbor. And the ship was safe. The Bible says, Jesus is our hope. The Bible says Jesus is, is not only the anchor, He's the rock as well. People, and maybe some of you here tonight, you're adrift. You get, you're just floating around. You get blown about by every new fad that comes along. Every new little song that comes along. Every new little doctrine that comes along. You get blown about and pushed about. You know why? There's no anchor for your soul. There's no anchor for your life. Jesus Christ is that anchor. And He is anchored and He is the rock that anchors us. The forerunner was Jesus. The Bible says He went into the veil. He entered into the presence of God. He's the forerunner. It means He went before us. So now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. So now we have access to God. He's the forerunner. The same thing of that sailor who would sail in with the anchor. He enters on our behalf. That means, you know what it means? You and I right now, we're not in heaven but I'm anchored there. And all God has to do is let the slack out of the rope. And I'm going there one day. I'm as good as in the harbor. I'm as good as home in heaven right now as if I were there already. It's a sure thing. It's a certainty. Our hope is safely anchored in Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The songwriter, I think it was John W. Peterson, when he wrote, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. The third stanza says, Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime, and it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from His precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure. Do you have that hope of eternal life? Oh, I don't mean I cross me. I hope I get there. I wish I will. Maybe I will. No, 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 no. Do you have a confident expectation you will? Huh? Have you cast your anchor in Jesus Christ? Has He anchored your soul there? And all he do, all, all we're doing is He's just tightening the line. And one of these days we'll cross over. But we're as sure as we're there right now because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, charity. But the ignored one is hope. Let's pray together. Shall we? Father, take our truth now this evening. Lord, I pray that we would be people of hope. Oh, there's so much that could be covered on this particular word, hope. But I pray, Lord, that you'll help some folks here this evening that have been believing you by faith. And Lord, they the doubts are growing. They still want to believe you by faith, but the doubts get stronger. I pray they continue to have faith. They continue to 
exercise that patience. Because that patience will bring experience and experience will yield way to hope. And they'll have a confident expectation of what you will do. Thank you for the hope of salvation. Thank you for the hope, the blessed hope of your return. Thank you for the hope we have. We'll see our loved ones again one day. And Lord, I pray that each of us would have hope tonight. And we would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And others would see that confidence and that assurance. The expectation that we have. And they desire that for their life as well. 